I'm currently joined by member for Borkham Hills and Parliamentary Secretary to the Premier, the Honourable David Elliott, and Mrs. Rina Jethi, Liberal candidate for the Legislative Council. Thank you so much for talking to me today. Thank you. How are you all? Good, yes, it's busy, five weeks to go. Yeah. Very well, counting down the days, actually. Yeah. Um, I want to start off by talking about education. Recently, you announced that should the bad government be re-elected, there will be increased spending on vocational education and training as a result of the New South Wales government's smart and skilled reforms. Why do you think there's a discrepancy in the way in which the state Liberal government and the federal Liberal government view education? I don't know if it's a discrepancy, um, but the demands on the education dollar are different. Um, the federal government has an education minister and an education budget, but no schools. Whereas the states, they're the ones who provide the schools. The states have always been school providers. And I'm sure Rena will have some comments about um, the education system since she's been brought in as a Liberal candidate because she's come from the education background. But so far as the skills, is, uh, skills services are concerned, in New South Wales, we had a parliamentary inquiry about two years ago. It was an uh, inquiry into the skills shortage. And the recommendations from the parliamentary inquiry and the evidence that that parliamentary inquiry received uh, suggested to us that we really needed to continuously update uh, our education policy and education funding. Uh, we had a situation in New South Wales where uh, if you were a 50-year-old uh, uh, empty nester, a, a, a mum who was you know, getting ready to retire and wanted to go and do pottery on the central coast, you would have a taxpayer subsidised qualification. You, know, you would be able to go to TAFE and have ta the taxpayers subsidise you pursuing that hobby. But um, that was at the expense of a kid from Borkham Hills who wanted to go to TAFE and become an electron electronic engineer or a mechanic. Now, our view was very clearly, the parliamentary inquiry was, listen, we need mechanics, we need uh, electron electricians, we don't really see the need for the taxpayer to subsidise uh, uh, somebody learning m m pottery on the central coast. So that created a need to review and reform. And we also accept the fact that the dynamics of the New South Wales economy are changing. Uh, in our electorate here, in this area that Rena and I live in, we've got the highest number of uh, secondary school age students per capita in the state. Wow. Uh, and nearly the highest number of, uh, of those percentage wise go to non-government schools. Uh, we've also got in this area the highest number of people per capita who have either TAFE or university qualifications. So they're either established tradesmen or they've got university degrees. Uh, and you just see the dynamics of the economy around here to realise that you know, policies need to continuously improve and reflect what the economy uh, is demanding. Okay. Mrs. Jethi, drawing upon your experiences as a teacher, what kind of change do you wish to see in the education system should you enter into the Legislative Council? Certainly. I would first of all agree with what David has just now uh, outlined and gone in depth with education system. It is more important for us as a Liberal government, as a part of the uh, party, to continue with that sustained release of funding into the education system. And it is fantastic what we have done until now, and we would like to continue that. It is important for our children, our next generation, to be educated and be aware to make informed decisions. So that's what our focus will be in our future education system and to continue with that. Fantastic. Luke Foley, leader of the opposition, has spoken about his support for the ESL curriculum in schools and providing increased funding to community language schools. Do these issues resonate with your policies? Uh, well, they do, and we've always had a very strong view about making sure that uh, uh, children leave schools with uh, a thorough understanding of the English language. Um, it was a Liberal government that uh, uh, made sure that uh, English was compulsory as part of the HSC. Uh, uh, various parliamentary inquiries since this government has been elected have also recommended not only English but maths should be compulsory at the HSC. But Rena's point that she just made is very, very pertinent to education policy. We need to give the children every chance to make the right decision. 
the right decision about where they're going to go, what they're going to do, what choices they're going to make. We can't afford to have a situation which we have had up until now, which, where students might change uh, their career choices three times over the course of uh, you know their, their late teens and their early 20s. And that's just not sustainable. We cannot be subsidising um, young people to go to, uh, to TAFE to do electronics only for them to decide halfway through their, um, their taxpayer subsidised qualification that they really don't want to be an electrician, they might want to be an electrical engineer, so they might go off to university after that, or indeed they might don't want to do any of that and they'll join the police force or they'll go and do a diploma of education and become a teacher. What we need to do is make sure that there's a flexible education system, an education system that gives the maximum amount of recognised prior learning so that if I do do that Cert 3 in electronics and I want to go and be an electrical engineer, well that Cert 3 in electronics from TAFE can be considered recognised prior learning towards my degree. Um, but it, what Rena said is very, very important and it can't be lost particularly uh, on those uh, families that have migrated to Australia and decided to um, take, uh, take their children through uh, and invest their children into the, um, into the New South Wales education system. They must be able to communicate. Part of that is uh, speaking English. Uh, part of that is making sure that uh, if they haven't got English as a first um, language at home, uh, that they're given every opportunity and every resource to ensure that if they do go off to tertiary education, that, um, uh, that, that, that English is not going to be holding them back. Do you have anything to say on it? Yes, certainly. Um, I would like to sh uh, first of all outline my own background. I am an English teacher in a state high school and I come from an ESL background myself. So this is a, an example, perfect example of what an individual could achieve provided they have a control on the language. English, as David just now said, it is compulsory. It has to be mastered by each and every individual. And as an Australian, it is very important for us to communicate to that uh, our, to our community and to our students. So here I am, an example myself, an English teacher from an ESL background. Right. Um, moving on to um, Australia being a republic now. Last month, Bill Shorten has called for a renewed debate about making Australia a republic. Mr Elliott, do you believe Australia becoming a republic is a feasible notion? Well, I'm on the record as saying that I think that our current constitutional arrangements have served us very, very well. Uh, and uh, I, would, uh, I would hate to see us change uh, our constitution just for the sake of it. I think that, you know, Australia and New Zealand and the United Kingdom are three of the longest serving democracies. Of course, uh, as a part of the Commonwealth, India is also a celebrated democracy, but um, for a variety of reasons, um, it hasn't had the length of democracy uh, that Australia and the United Kingdom and New Zealand has, despite our very, very close relationship and the similarities between the two systems, or the, the four systems. Um, so no, I think the Queen has served us well. Um, I have a great deal of faith that uh, uh, the Prince William uh, and Princess Kate will be uh, wonderful sovereigns. Uh, I think the fact that uh, the Crown keeps the Commonwealth together, uh, although no formal constitutional relationship with many of those uh, members of the Commonwealth, uh, I think that uh, in, this in this age of um, internationalism, having a little family like the Commonwealth so that we've got friendly relationships with so many other countries is very, very important. And, you know, to, to, to prove to everybody how, how um, appealing the Commonwealth is, and our, um, you only have to see nations in Africa that actually traditionally haven't been members of the Commonwealth and are applying for it. You know, we've got countries like Rwanda and Chad in Africa uh, who want to be part of the Commonwealth because they can see this wonderful um, family of, of nations and they see the wonderful um, uh, way that we relate to each other and, uh, and we communicate and we trade and we meet every year at Chogham and we meet every four years at the Commonwealth Games uh, and it, probably it's no coincidence that all the great cricketing nations are members of the Commonwealth as well. Uh, I think that um, I think that uh, that is uh, that is that is part of our psyche, our culture, that we really shouldn't be thinking about letting go uh, at this point in time. Okay. As you are both working parents, I wanted to know what you thought of the Abbott government's recently axed paid parental leave scheme. Uh, I'm probably not going to be a beneficiary of it as much <laughs> as maybe Rena would have been. Um, and, you know, there's a, it would have been lovely 
but it's just too expensive. Uh, it was it was an expensive option for us to pursue. Uh, and I think Tony Abbott's done the right thing. It's a, it's a federal issue, of course, so it does, really doesn't have much to do with Rena and I in our role as state candidates. Uh, but we do door knock, we do meet people. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's like the old saying, you know, should we have more long weekends? Yes, Rena and I would love more long weekends. And if somebody said to us, would you support another long weekend? We'd probably have to say in our hearts, yes, we would, because that's another um, opportunity for us to spend time with our family. But at the end of the day, we can't afford it. Right. Despite the fact that it doesn't affect you as state candidates, it does affect you as working parents in this society. What do you think about this issue? Look, I personally agree with exactly what David has said. We cannot be focused on short-term gains. We have to look at long-term achievements, and that's what Liberal Party is all about. If we are looking at just uh, pleasing a small community by this paid parental leave, and that accounts for myself as well. I am a parent, I'm a working parent, but I have to understand that what will serve the community in long term. And that I personally am very supportive of every decision that has been taken. Okay. So back to you, but yes, it has to be done. Do you believe a return to power will be considerably easy for the coalition since they have a large majority of the seats in the New South Wales Parliament? Uh, we never take anything for granted, ever. Um, and you can't in politics. Uh, we got a very strong majority at the last election in 2011. Uh, and uh, and Rena was part of that campaign locally, so this is an opportunity for her to get some exposure at the state-wise campaign as a candidate for the upper house. Um, but, uh, you know, we've had to make tough decisions. We've had to do things like uh, lease out the, uh, promise to lease out the electricity uh, poles and wires. Uh, that's not a popular decision, but it's the right decision. Uh, we've had to change um, workers' compensation laws. We've had to um, pull back uh, some of the very, very expensive uh, policies that the previous government um, left us. But if it's any consolation, those decisions have meant we have now, in four short years, halved the state debt. We have halved the state debt. So if people stick with us, Hopefully when Rena and I are seeking a third term uh, in 2019, we'll be able to go to the electorate and say, this state is debt free. Uh, and so some of those tough decisions that we had to make, we can now review again uh, because there'll be money in the treasury. Okay. What are some changes you'd like to see should you be re-elected this year? Locally or, no, okay, um, what am I campaigning on? Well, I'd love to see the Norwest Rail finished ahead of schedule and Me under too. budget. Uh, and it looks like it is. Uh, and uh, as Rena and I, working parents, um, you know, that is a resource, that is uh, some infrastructure that our children will probably use if, if they get off to university. Um, I'm very keen to see uh, another um, a pedestrian overpass on Windsor Road. I'm very keen to see uh, Memorial Drive widened. Uh, I'm very keen to see the congestion at the Norwest Business Park eased a little bit. Um, I, I've, uh, I've got a soft little dream that we get some more commuter car parking uh, along the M2. Uh, but, you know, I, this community, this community um, doesn't have, my electorate doesn't have a police station, it doesn't have a train station, it doesn't have a courthouse, it doesn't have a public hospital. It's got one fire station, one fire station. Other than the public schools, yeah. it's got one fire station. Um, and what makes this community unique is that even though we have one fire station as so far as the public infrastructure is concerned, everything's provided by the community groups, the churches, the clubs, the rotary. Uh, we have uh, a thing called the India Club uh, that services my electorate as well. And, you know, these guys not just look after their own little patch, but they're always there for other organisations and community groups as well. Uh, so I just want to create an environment in my electorate. You know, we've just started, we've just announced the Neighbour of the Year Award for Borkham Hills. So okay. people are being invited to nominate a Neighbour of the Year and they win a $100 Castle Towers voucher. So these, these things are what we really want to um, uh, encourage. Uh, and uh, and uh, this is the sort of community that I would like to spend the next four years promoting. How about you, Mrs. Jeffy? We are a very close-knit and a very supportive community, and we want to continue like that, and certainly uphold the Liberal Party uh, uh, motto for that we will bring down the cost and increase the infrastructure. 
we really need that and we have continued to do that. David has made phenomenal changes in the community, provided for the car parking, provided for the communication to happen. Everything is smooth sailing, but we want to increase and intensify that. So that will be our goal. How will the Hills District and Western Sydney in general benefit from a coalition win? Uh, probably primarily by our infrastructure. Um, the biggest burden to Western Sydney is a congestion. Uh, you know, there are unemployment is is good, is uh, is, is is manageable. Uh, you know, I remember under the previous federal Labor government of Bob Hawke and Paul Keating, we had a million people unemployed. We don't have those unemployment rates in New South Wales and particularly Western Sydney at the moment. We've announced the West Connects, the North Connects. We've uh, opened the South Western Rail Link. The North West Rail Link is uh, is well and truly on schedule. And we're hoping that the uh, Badgerys Creek Airport will, will um, create jobs and infrastructure as well. We're widening things like uh, the Northern Road at Malagoa. Uh, we're going to be um, uh, spending a billion dollars at Westmead Hospital. Uh, we've uh, introduced a new style of schooling in um, Parramatta with the high-rise schools. Uh, and we've also got uh, plans to introduce a light rail network uh, in Western Sydney based in Parramatta. So um, it's a good time to be living in Western Sydney for the first time in a long time, uh, Western Sydney is getting some serious infrastructure spent on it. But you've got to remember this, the economy of Western Sydney is larger than Singapore's. So we have an, a resource here that we just cannot take for granted. Uh, and if we turn our back on it now after we've said to everybody we're going to invest in the future of Western Sydney, well then, like uh, would like would happen in Singapore if their government decided to say, well, we're going to hold back and stop um, spending money on infrastructure or, um, or, or progress uh, policy reforms to, uh, to improve employment and, and, and job satisfaction and job retention uh, and, uh, and, and make, make it a, a, a place to invest in. If we, if we move away from those uh, core beliefs, uh, well then we're just going to turn Western Sydney back into uh, the backwater that it was under Labor. What do you believe is the significance of having political candidates from different ethnic backgrounds? Um, this has become common. Um, the political parties have now um, worked out that the face of the electorate uh, needs to be uh, reflected by its parliamentary candidates. But our side, the Liberal Party doesn't go for the, uh, never has gone for um, the whole, uh, we must have a certain um, ethnic group represented here or, or we have to have a, you know, a woman here um, because everything, we're, we're very much a meritocracy. Um, and as much as I love having a, a local Indian candidate in Raman Bala and Rina Jethi uh, representing the Liberal Party here, neither of them have been pre-selected because of their race, colour, creed, or, a, or, a, or mother tongue. Um, Rena has got a master's degree and she's highly qualified and a very, very well respected member of the local community. Raman, similarly in Blacktown, has got, a, has got a legitimate claim for a seat in the parliament as a Liberal MP. Uh, and then you go beyond that and say in Granville, we've got Tony Issa, we're in, in Prospect we've got Andy Rowan. Uh, you know, both of them come from the Middle East, um, but neither of them, and because they both came through the parliament via local government, neither of them would be, they, they would both be horrified to think that they were members of parliament because of their ethnic background. Okay. Um, they beat, um, they beat Anglo-Celtic candidates, uh, you know, uh, second, third generation Australian candidates for pre-selection and for the election um, on the votes of people that probably had no concept of what their nationality was okay. uh, or their birth, um, uh, or, or the nation of their birth was. Mrs Jethi, do you ever feel a certain pressure to represent the Indian community? Look, uh, with the Liberal Party, I have never felt any kind of pressure whatsoever. They have been extremely supportive. It is a teamwork. Let me just reflect back on where I come from and how I came to Australia. Australia is a beautiful land. I came here under the skilled migration program and that was initiated by the Liberal government. And no wonder I am so much in love with their ethics and values. John Harvard, had he not introduced that, may I ask the millions of migrants who came on that skilled um, passport and skilled visa, how could that have happened? And that's where I switch 
further into freedom of choice. And that's where we are here. And I come from that freedom of choice and that freedom of thought process and joined the Liberal Party. I always believed in their policies and what they have in their mind to make Australia the best of the countries on the face of Earth. So I never felt any pressure whatsoever, and I'm really proud to be a part of this team. It is a very cohesive and an extremely supportive team, and we are out there counting the days to prove it right. Um, speaking of the Liberal Party, in regards to the leadership spill, do you believe the issues facing the federal government could impact on the state elections? No, because uh, Australians have got a pretty good in, um, uh, way of determining what's federal and what's state and what's local. Um, it'd be no different to us uh, if, uh, if, the, if, if Mike Baird wasn't polling well and we had a local government election. The, council, the Liberal councillors in the Hillshire are doing a good job. Uh, and, and I must say, it's, it's not really something that people are... When they look at Mike Baird, they see somebody who is getting rid of debt, somebody who is uh, managing the state. Uh, and I think that's what they're focusing on. Okay. Exactly. I don't think uh, it has any reflection on straight, state um, politics or government or our election because we have our definite role and we will continue to deliver. So that's where we are heading on to. Okay. Considering the results of the recent Queensland elections, are you concerned about the unpredictability of voters in New South Wales? Yes, um, because we don't take any vote for granted. I um, mean, you know, re research now suggests that 40% of the electorate won't make their decision until the election's uh, And the result of an election can be determined by as few as 3% of the population. Uh, and Queensland was an, a classic example about how um, you can't t you can't take any votes for granted. But this isn't a new phenomenon. I mean, uh, Jeff Kennett, um, having served for two terms in Victoria, completely reformed the Victorian economy. Uh, he then turned around and lost uh, an election. At which point, the government, the uh, the people in Victoria thought, "What did we do? What what made us vote for uh, the Labor Party over Jeff Kennett?" Nick Griner, same thing. Two elections reformed the New South Wales economy, and um, uh, and then uh, the voters went uh, went away from Nick Griner and voted for um, for Bob Carr. So we don't take any votes for granted, uh, and and I don't think you'd find any Liberal candidate out there today thinking that they're definitely going to win their seat. Same. I don't think we rest on our laurels at all. And every incident, every event is a learning process for our team. And as you would have seen, Liberal Party candidates are out there door knocking, being in the community, being a part of the community, talking to them day in and day out. And that's why we never take even a single vote for granted, as David said. And you will see us more often and even more as we go closer to the date. Uh, Mr. Elliot, Mrs. Jethi, what is your final message to the voters in your constituency? I think um, the voters should look at our record and uh, make a make a decision on what they saw under 16 years of labour with um, with corruption, with um, the lack of infrastructure, uh, with high taxes, and look at what Mike Baird's delivering. Um, an honest government, uh, members of parliament who are found to have done the wrong thing are immediately removed from the parliament. We've reduced payroll tax, um, we've reduced uh, the burden of, uh, of government, and uh, and we're building infrastructure, and I think that's probably the most important thing that um, your, uh, your viewers should be considering before they go to the polls. Certainly, our golden thumb rule is to bring down the cost and increase the infrastructure. And we are supportive of Mike Baird in his uh, dream come true, and we'll make that possible. Well, those are all my questions. Thank you so much for talking to me today, and good luck for the elections. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.